and Friday will be cloudy with a 60% chance of death fog taking you into your weekend. Turning now to the extremely long range forecast as we head into 2050, we can see we just collectively beefed it by overshooting internationally agreed upon climate targets and shattering the fragile balance of the global climate system that has made organized human life possible since the end of the Pleistocene epoch. So if you're on the coast, make sure to pack your umbrellas and your lifeboats as the seas swallow your cities. Meanwhile, inner wasteland dwellers will want to siphon as much gas as possible into your rocket dune buggies before marauding through the decaying corpse of civilization. And as always, drink plenty of water, wear sunscreen, and hoard ammunition. Hey, when you think about climate change, is this what you have in mind? Well, the good news is none of whatever that was is inevitable. Sure, scientists may have projections from advanced climate models run on supercomputers and back-tested against historical weather patterns and satellite data, but what do they really know? The answer may surprise you. It's a lot. They, they know a lot. But what those models can't predict is the most important variable. What will we do as a species in the coming years? How will humanity change in the face of climate change? Of course, we all know how to solve this. Everyone just needs to take personal responsibility to lower their carbon footprint. You know, change our light bulbs, suck on mushy paper straws, sell all our possessions, live in a hole in the forest, and subsist off twigs and delicious bugs. That's the only way to solve the climate crisis, right? Right? Or maybe, just maybe, worrying about your personal carbon footprint is BS. Or maybe it's some third, more nuanced thing in between those two extremes. Uh. Hi, I'm Hazel Thayer, and this is The Climate Breakdown. Welcome to The Climate Breakdown, where we break down the breakdown of the climate without giving you a mental breakdown. By now, you've already heard about your carbon footprint. There are a bajillion calculators online that ask you questions like, how often do you fly? Do you eat meat? Do you drive a car? Do you wash your yogurt containers before putting them in the recycling? Or do you hate Mother Earth? Patooey. And then it spews out an estimate of how much carbon dioxide you personally inflict upon the planet each year. But here's the thing about carbon footprints. Before it was used to guilt you for living your own gosh darn life, it was a scientific term used to discuss the ecological effect that human systems had on the planet. And we called it the ecological footprint, not the carbon footprint. Plus it was actually coined in Canada by William Reese and Matisse Wackernagel in this book, Our Ecological Footprint. This book talks about how we, collectively, in Canada and other wealthy countries, have to work together to make our entire economies more sustainable and fair. In this book, you'll see, well, it's, it's, a, lo it's a lot of feet. They're really, they're really driving the point home. My favorite one is particularly ominous. The longer we wait, the harder the adjustment will be. This strangely busty female foot has been saying it for longer than I've been alive. You'll also see, that sucked, sorry. But you'll also see calls to convert to a circular economy, changing our food systems, phasing out use of fossil fuels. Remember that one. And yes, even ways to calculate your own footprint and do your bit to help. How much of the book was dedicated to your personal footprint, you ask? Like like three pages. That's right. This book filled with science and sexy anthropomorphic feet dedicated just three measly pages to your personal footprint. Changes you can make. Why? Because... It's a collective problem, requires collective solutions. That's William Reese. His name's on the footprint book. I'm a professor emeritus, that means retired professor from the University of British Columbia. I designed a concept called the ecological footprint, which is a measure of the actual area of productive ecosystems required by any defined population, it could be a single individual, a city or a country, uh, required to sustain or to produce all the biologically relevant material flows consumed by that population and to assimilate their carbon wastes. That's right. The ecological footprint is a real scientific framework meant overwhelmingly to cover populations, not individuals. And that's why there's only like three pages about personal actions in here. But those three pages were all big polluting companies needed to turn the collective ecological footprint on its head to blame you personally 
for their actions. In 2004, BP, short for British, oops, we accidentally poisoned the Gulf of Mexico with three million barrels of petroleum, launched their own carbon footprint calculator alongside a broader marketing strategy encouraging individuals to take responsibility for their impact on the planet. BP spent $100 million on this campaign to help us normals reduce our carbon footprints. And with that, the carbon footprint went mainstream. How much carbon I produce? Is that it? You mean the effect that my living has on the Earth in terms of the products I consume? And BP's plan paid off. Suddenly, environmentalism wasn't about passing climate-friendly laws or organizing boycotts of polluting companies. It was about you. What can you do? How can you drive less, take shorter showers, remember your reusable bags and your travel mugs? In other words, it limited climate action to one question. How can you buy better? Change your light bulbs was literally one of the pieces of advice at the end of an inconvenient truth. You know, the more time those Prius driving yuppies spent calling the carbon footprint police on each other, the less they would worry about all of us transitioning from fossil fuels to clean energy. That really would have hurt BP's bottom line. So congrats to the PR genius who probably bought this book for the spicy feet pics and then realized he could use it for his clients at BP. The carbon footprint idea, not the, not the feet part. So wait, what's wrong with watching your carbon footprint? I don't eat meat or own a car. Is that like a complete waste of time? Should I just throw my bike into the river and roll coal with my buddies instead? Am I a massive sucker? If I tell you that your carbon footprint is 17 tons, what does that mean? What are you comparing that to? Is that too much? Is it not enough? I don't know, who knows? Thank you, BP, for uh, pointing out this uh, deficit in my lifestyle. I've fixed it. A lot of people who are worried about the climate try to decrease their carbon footprint, realize how hard it is, or start to think that it's pointless, and give up. The main issue is that the human system is in a state of overshoot. And the issue is that there are too many people, especially too many wealthy people, consuming and polluting too much. Carbon footprint is one indicator of excess pollution. And they think that by focusing on that, you will be distracted from the real problem and we can carry on business as usual. This is a distraction. It's not irrelevant, but it's a distraction from the main issue. Why is it so hard? Because society currently is structured around, you know, drill, baby, drill, using oil. You can't decide where your energy comes from or how easy it is to avoid driving in your town or whether or not your city actually recycles the stuff that you put in your recycling bin. So what should we do instead of feeling guilty? Become politically engaged and insist that your governments cope with the change, meaning reduce our total throughput of energy and material, share what we have more equitably among the population. What we need is a frontal attack on the nature of our lifestyles on a finite planet. Think of it like a Venn diagram. Right now, usually the easiest thing to do is also the most pollutingest thing to do. That's the default mode of the fossil-fueled growth economy. But what if we brought, you know, right thing to do for the planet, easy thing to do, and cheapest thing to do cl closer together? Take cycling, for example. It's way cheaper than driving, but no one who cares about living will do it if it means navigating a death maze of SUVs like a real-life frogger every time you need to get to work. But what if you and your neighbors could advocate for bike lanes in your town or organize community solar for your neighborhood? That's where the good stuff's at. So instead of only worrying about plastic bags and cleaning out our yogurt containers, how about we build a ground-up movement to make our economy more sustainable and fair? Why don't we try something new, like rational policies and community action? Oh hey, thanks for watching the first episode of The Climate Breakdown. This series is kind of an experiment for the Weather Network, so if you want to see more, let us know in the comments and make sure to subscribe. One thing we didn't have time to mention in the video is that Matisse Wagernackel, the co-author of this book, went on to found the Global Footprint Network, which then created Earth Overshoot Day. That's the day where the world officially uses up more resources than the planet can regenerate. In 2023, Earth Overshoot Day was August 2nd. Or, in other words, we'd need 1.7 Earths at our current level of consumption. You can check out footprintnetwork.org to see how we can push that date back.
The Climate Breakdown is a production of The Goose in partnership with The Weather Network. I'm Hazel Thayer. You can follow me at Hazel is online basically everywhere. Peace.